thank you very much. So I have been at various places over the last 20 years, including Technical University of Munich, where I got my education, ETH Zurich, where I did my habilitation a few times at MIT. And over the last year, I moved back uh, to Germany, uh, to Hamburg, and still have an adjunct appointment at MIT, which goes on as long as they like to see me. Okay, so, so much uh, to my background. And uh, so now I will, and of course I want to acknowledge your funding, uh, and especially the Projet de Roca, which enabled us to have Giovanni Zermi at MIT for a while, and he is uh, moving now also along uh, to Hamburg. And my, some of the research I show here would not have been possible without that. And I think uh, the major advantage of having such a program is really seeing as a people how they work. Uh, and makes the best out of you for yourself and progress. And uh, then I moved to this institution, uh, CFEL, uh, which is in DESIA German National Laboratory in Hamburg. And uh, of course, uh, what uh, that institution has to offer is, of course, that lots of people are working in that area, which I'm talking about, that they're only a part about it. And so that is what the attractiveness of that place is when you ask yourself, why do you go from MIT uh, to Hamburg? And of course, everybody knows Hamburg, it's a nice city. And there are other things uh, to that move. And uh, that laboratory is relatively new, and it's essentially funded by uh, DAISY, which is a part of the Helmholtz Society in Germany, and uh, Max Planck Society, and the University of Hamburg. Okay, with that introduction, I really want to start um, my talk. And of course, the work is seldomly done by the person who talks. It's really the students. Uh, and this work is still done at MIT. Uh, and research scientists and postdocs, and uh, here Giovanni Zirmi, which was who was funded from uh, nine, 2009 to 2010 by the Projet de Rocca, Alexander Seller, Humboldt Fellow, and uh, Aminija Maleri and Noah Sheng. And also this work again would not have been possible and has long, due to that program, has long standing connection to Politecnico Milano, uh, Giulio Cerullo and Christian Manzoni. And we have a long standing uh, collaboration with Sandra De Silvestri, which was my habilitation, on my habilitation committee uh, 15 years ago or something like that. Okay, so uh, what is this controlling uh, uh, light and atoms on uh, at the second precision, what is it about? What is the long-term vision of that field and why do we need that? Uh, that is actually a structure of a, a membrane protein photosystem one, which was measured with a free electron laser. I will explain later why, uh, how that works, okay? Uh, but the vision is that we really want to look at complex molecules, molecules which are more complicated than you can compute them on a computer. So you need experiments to really look into, si into them to see A, their structure, and B, how they function. That means you do not only need to find the position of all the atoms in that molecules, which can be 10,000s of atoms. Uh, you also would like to see how those molecules deform on different time scales, and how charge transfer occurs in that molecules, maybe down to the other second level. And there are many approaches, and one is based on this free electron laser instrumentation, which is now operating in a couple of places. We'll talk about that later. Uh, there is also one operating at Hamburg, and a bigger one is going to be built. That measurement was actually done by a colleague in Hamburg at LCLS in Stanford. And what that uh, picture essentially shows is uh, that you can do with this kind of new instrumentation uh, measurements on proteins and get the same resolution back which you had already before, actually, at the moment, in synchrotron facilities. Uh, but in the future, you might be able to do that actually at groups of molecules which were not amenable to be understood by synchrotron radiation in structure. And eventually, due to the time structure, you can also see how that molecule is moving on various time scales. Okay. Uh, and here a little bit about the performance of uh, X-ray uh, sources over uh, the years of the invention, of course, it goes back all the way to Röntgen when he invented the X-ray tube. And what is shown here on this axis is actually a quantity, which I didn't give you it because it's not that easy to understand, but essentially what it means is how many X-ray photons can you throw on a small target. Let's leave it at that for the moment. And of course, X-ray tubes 
can do something, and it's good enough to image your body, uh, because you don't need high resolution, but then people, due to the fact that they could accelerate electrons to relativistic velocities, could improve their brightness in synchrotron radiation, and that is essentially where we understand today most of the structure of all proteins, okay, which are known about 30 or 60,000, I forgot a little bit the number. Uh, the, uh, the structure has all been identified by synchrotron radiation, and of course it's clear that this is helpful for the development of uh, understanding chemistry, development of medicine and pharmaceuticals. Okay. However, uh, these light sources have a limitation in the brightness they can achieve, and especially uh, cell mo membrane proteins, actually the one I showed before, is of that group, which make up 60% of all the medication which is used at the moment, their structure cannot be imaged by synchrotron radiation. And so uh, people in develop these X-ray uh, free electron lasers, uh, which can improve this brightness by 10 orders of magnitude, and one might ultimately be able to image the structure of a single molecule, also this will not happen tomorrow quite, but over the next a couple of years, maybe five, ten years, uh, this can happen, and eventually also with time resolution on these relevant time scales. Okay, and it is certainly true that we don't understand yet the function in detail of these large molecules, and it's that, will up, uh, plant, that will open up plenty of applications uh, in the future, and of course it has immediate impact on fundamental research in the various disciplines. So since not everybody lives in this femto and other second world, here a little bit uh, a reminder uh, what that means and what happens on this time scale. Uh, so light travels in a second, obviously very fast, from the moon to the earth, okay, roughly. Uh, on a picosecond, it only moves a fraction of a millimeter, uh, so something like a, the thickness of a blade of a knife. Uh, in a femtosecond, that is actually the period of an optical wave, and therefore it moves the wavelengths, okay? That's a micron, roughly. And in an attosecond, of course, it's a uh, uh, thousand times slower, uh, or faster, actually. Uh, that is the period of X-rays, so slowing we come into the period of X-rays, and therefore you move over a unit cell in a solid, and that is why when you shine that light into a solid, that you get actually multiple diffraction and interference of that diffraction, and you can resolve the structure again of solids or uh, uh, even molecules. Uh, and what is shown here is, of course, so as that is about the spatial scale when we uh, uh, convert light durations into a spatial scale. Here is a temporal scale. So uh, on a picosecond time scale uh, and down to a couple of 10 femtoseconds, you can have nuclear motions in, in molecules. Okay, and when you come into this uh, range of uh, sub-10 femtoseconds to attoseconds, that is actually how fast electrons run around in an atom. Uh, and uh, then, of course, even shorter time scales, uh, that is septotensis, that is where nuclear dynamics occurs. And uh, uh, the window which are of interest to these free electron lasers at the moment is this range of uh, 100 femtoseconds uh, and potentially to the attosecond domain. And to get an understanding of atomic or molecular processes in um, atoms, molecules, and also condensed matter. And of course, in order to do that, with this time scale, there is also an energy scale associated with it uh, in order to connect later uh, to X-rays and EOV radiation. Uh, so in order to generate pulses which are that short and also to resolve the structure on a spatial scale, we better have light waves which enable that duration. That means high enough energy uh, because uh, time and uh, frequency are conjugate variables, so the shorter the time scale is, the higher uh, are the frequencies we need to engage in order to generate such short events, and the higher are the energies, because with uh, Planck's law, that frequency is associated to energy, uh, we get this kind of 10 to kV energies, and even shorter to 10 kVs of energy, if we want to resolve uh, the structure of atoms and molecules. So that is as a large-scale vision of why we want to build tools, essentially, which enable attosecond uh, precision uh, measurements. Okay. And there are a couple of such tools are at the moment being built, and you can envision them as super microscopes in space and time. And uh, their uh, uh, task is really to resolve structure, dynamics, and function of atoms, molecules, 
in condensed matter, and especially large ones, so some which are not simple and amenable to any other interrogation, uh, then building this large-scale infrastructure. And of course, there's just one built around the corner in Trieste, Fermi, uh, which is sort of uh, on a 400 meter length scale and it's operating since uh, last year. And of course, there's LCLS in Stanford, which operated since 2009. And uh, there's Flash in Hamburg, which is a smaller version, but there's at the moment a big construction project on the European XFL, which is three and a half kilometers long, and it hopefully operates at 2015. And you might ask yourself, is one enough? Well, they all have different properties and it's uh, delicate to go into all these properties. They cover different wavelength ranges and they have different capabilities uh, in terms of repetition rate. And if you, of course, make measurements of these molecules, you need to do not only one measurement, you need to do it a million times. And so if you don't work at high repetition rates, it takes a very long time to detect that structure. And of course, I don't want to talk about all of these aspects. What I want to uh, show you is actually the work we are working on and that is how light can be used to control these free electron lasers and its output uh, on a femtosecond and attosecond time scale. And you see these machines are large, so it's not that trivial to actually get over such large uh, uh, spatial ranges a machine operating that ultimately allows attosecond resolution. So of course, other sources under development, which are smaller than a free electron laser, but they have different capabilities. And another aspect is actually one can make this light which comes out of these free electron lasers fully coherent uh, uh, by seeding it with high harmonic radiation. I actually will not talk too much about seeding, but actually will talk about the new laser system which might make a contribution to that one, but we developed actually in the ROCA uh, project. Uh, okay. So uh, these machines are large. So here you see LCLS in Stanford. They a, a use an old 50 year old, three kilometer long linear collider, which was already anyways here, and used the last third of a section uh, to make this free electron laser, which we will discuss in a, in a minute. Or here, Fermi in Trieste, which is the Letra facility in Trieste, and they built here this a few hundred meter long uh, uh, free electron laser, and the planned European XFL in extent going from uh, the Daisy site, which is still in town in Hamburg, actually to the next state, in Schleswig-Holstein, in Schenefeld, uh, where the experiments are carried out. So this is about a two kilometer long accelerator uh, bringing electrons to some relativistic speed and then letting them radiate in undulators. And here you do experiments looking at the structure. So how do this uh, free electron, X-ray free electron lasers uh, work? Uh, so it all starts essentially by creating a short electron bunch in an electron gun. I don't want to talk uh, too much about it, how this uh, happens. So you shine a, an optical pulse on this electron gun and uh, uh, RF fields extract an electron bunch from a cathode, okay? And then this electron bunch is accelerated in a linear accelerator, which was developed for particle physics, uh, and eventually compressed to something like 100 femtoseconds. So that is this blue pulse here, okay? Uh, it's very hard to see where I am exactly. And uh, actually can directly be sent in what is called an undulator. Undulator is nothing than a magnetic array, a array of magnets, which wiggle at the trajectory of these electrons and an accelerating electron is of course emitting radiation. And by choosing the period right and the energy of that electron beam right, uh, you can generate an X-ray pulse, which is then uh, uh, shot on, is then shot on these uh, molecules and we measure diffraction images. So that is how it works. <coughs> yeah, that is more intense. Uh, and of course, so this whole facility can be on the order of, of a few hundred meters to up to a few kilometers. And it's clear that uh, we might also do at the end, actually want to make a movie. That means uh, we actually uh, want to excite with an optical laser these molecules to start to do some dynamics and then we come later with a flash and look at the dynamics. And uh, this is especially good if actually the beam is fully coherent. And so we might even seed uh, the build up of that X-rays with a seed laser, whatever that is. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, to essentially amplify or start with some coherence which is produced by that seed laser to convert it into the X-ray regime. And it's clear if this pulse is, for example, 100 or maybe 
at the end, at only a few 10 femtoseconds short, uh, that all these uh, things have to be synchronized with each other over that distance on the order of a few 10 femtoseconds. And the question is, how are you going uh, to do that? And uh, today, essentially, what well, today that was actually five years ago, people wanted to have sort of sub 10 femtosecond precision, okay? And since we talk about attosecond science here, of course, people would like to move in the next 10 years, maybe, uh, into the direction of synchronizing all the systems uh, to the sub femtosecond uh, domain, or even with 100 attosecond precision. The question is, is that possible at all, okay? And actually, we also at MIT tried for a long time to get such a free electron laser project going, but, uh, you know, the, uh, the funding over the last 10 years in building large, new large-scale facilities in the US was not favorable. Uh, but we came up with a timing distribution system, which was then developed, actually, supported also by Trieste and Daisy in Hamburg. Uh, we came up with the following timing distribution system. All these uh, facilities have already a a stable microwave source, which usually drives all the systems and gives the timing. Uh, we tightly synchronize to that what we call an optical master oscillator, which is a mode locked laser set. is nothing else than a laser which we have disciplined to generate a train of short pulses, okay? And we hook up those pulses to this microwave source. And then uh, we essentially uh, transport that pulse stream to all the positions in the facility where we need precisely synchronized events in time to synchronize the local equipment to it. Uh, and we do that over timing stabilized fiber links. Uh, and uh, then we have locally either to synchronize a local laser to the output of that fiber link or regenerate a very nice clean RF signal which drives the accelerator components. Yeah. Or do the same thing again and build also a seed laser and we'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, yeah, synchronize actually also the pump probe laser to it. Okay, so how are we uh, going to do that? And of course there are various approaches, uh, uh, like for example, CW distribution at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. But we decided to do that one primarily because we are in the ultra fast area and it has lots of advantages, but I don't wanna bore you with all these details too much, okay? Uh, that is then shown how such an experiment is really done. It's also uh, by my colleague Chapman a, a picture. So at the moment, uh, they inject essentially they have these molecules dissolved in a jet, in a solution. And these molecules are grown actually to little crystals. Uh, and the advantage of this very high brightness free electron lasers is that you don't have to grow those crystals so large because they have such a high brightness that you can focus so well and can actually hit the 100 nanometer size uh, uh, crystal. So they, those crystals are essentially with a water jet blown into the beam of this elect free electron laser, which generated already now something like a few 10 femtoseconds uh, or even shorter X-ray pulses. And it hits a bunch of such uh, nanocrystals and gives a diffraction pattern. Okay, and this is a little bit a complicated arrangement to essentially uh, measure strongly diffracting pieces and weaker diffracting pieces in different sections. Okay, and later, this is uh, essentially completed by an optical pump so that we can initiate a reaction in a molecule and with a certain delay as uh, X-ray comes, it makes a snapshot of that. And uh, the big advantage is of course also what is called here imaging before destruction. That is a big advantage of free electron lasers against uh, synchrotrons. That the X-ray pulses are so short that you can actually get enough diffracted electron before uh, the X-rays completely destroy the target and everything flies apart, okay? Uh, because you have such high intensities that it essentially in each shot your target is destroyed, so you have to feed it in every shot from a steady uh, stream of solutions from a jet. Okay, so how can we now use uh, the information of an optical pulse to control that instrumentation? Okay, to that level. And we actually can use uh, various knobs in an optical pulse to get to attosecond precision. So what is an optical pulse? An optical pulse has, is at very high frequencies, yeah, terahertz, hundreds of terahertz. It's a carrier. And uh, we have a certain frequency band around it. And for example, if we 
take one octave of spectrum of frequencies, uh, then we produce already a very short pulse which only contains roughly underneath the envelope uh, a one and a half optical cycle. So the pulse width uh, contains only a few optical cycles. Okay. And now actually earlier we learned already from work of House, Mekotzi and others that this pulse has a couple of degrees of freedom which are very easy to see. One is the carrier underneath the envelope can have a certain position. There could be shifts precisely uh, uh, between uh, the maximum of that carrier wave and the maximum of the envelope. And that we can control. And actually, over the last decade, we learned how to control that. But there is also the center of mass motion of that pulse, which can be uh, localized to upper second position. And you can use both informations to do something on an upper second scale. And there are also other degrees of freedom, like for example, the amplitude can change or the frequency can vary. But for today, those two of degrees of freedoms, uh, that means the optical phase underneath the envelope and actually the position of the pulse itself is good enough for doing various uh, things. Okay. Uh, and it turns out actually that these pulse streams, which I can generate by femtosecond laser technology, are very quiet compared to signals which we are well known or uh, used to, microwave signals, and they are much lower noise and there is a very simple to understand physical reason for that. Uh, so if you look at a typical electronic oscillator, a microwave oscillator that has typically a cavity where a microwave standing wave is contained into it, or if you are not so good in electrical, think about a guitar string on a guitar, okay, which is oscillating. <laughs> And we take a, cup, a little bit of this electrical energy we couple out of the resonator. And if we would have many of these resonators and they would start always the same phase to oscillate, they would run out of phase because there is always a little bit of noise added. This noise typically comes from the fact that you extract energy, so you need to have some gain medium inside to replenish that energy. And actually, on a more fundamental limit, there is also noise fluctuations coming into the cavity itself from the outside, from the world you couple to. And they both add up and essentially jitter around uh, the phase of that microwave signal. So if you would like look at many oscillators, they would run out of phase of time because there are different noise sources. Or if you look at one oscillator which is impacted by that noise all the time, it runs, it makes a random motion, that zero crossing, which is called phase noise or timing jitter. Okay. And you also see immediately, just by inspection, that if you inject a certain height amount of noise level, if that slope is much faster, then actually it, chitters, it is much less corrupted by the noise. Uh, the window uh, if at the same noise level is shorter if you have a very short transient. And that is actually fundamental. And so if you do a little bit of analysis, then you see that the diffusion rate with how much the uncertainty grows in these zero crossings uh, with time scales actually by uh, the inverse slope. That means it's exactly proportional to the period of that oscillator. And then of course, there's a certain amount of noise injected and there's a certain uh, amount of energy stored. And if there's more energy stored in your pulse, noise will not lead to such large fluctuations. So that is roughly the law how this diffusion rate grows. And that is the reason why we, when we go now to the optical domain, where we have much more bandwidth and can actually create signals with a much stronger slope, they are intrinsically much more robust against noise. So uh, what is a femtosecond? Essentially, uh, a laser is now a, a cavity made up of mirrors, and uh, when we mode lock it, what we call mode locking, or short pulse generation, then we manage not to have a continuously lasing laser, we manage that all the energy is concentrated in a short pulse, and since we have a such uh, high frequencies available, we can man generate much shorter pulses. And if I would do the same comparison like up here, uh, you might guess what happens already, that the diffusion rate of the position of these pulses with time when it is subjected uh, to noise uh, scales exactly like this microwave signal. But now we have here the pulse width where we before had the period of this microwave signal. Uh, which was 100 picosecond for a 10 gigahertz microwave signal, which is typically. Uh, here we can easily have 100 femtoseconds or even 10 femtoseconds short pulses. 
And uh, therefore, uh, we gave here, in terms of this diffusion rate, we get a 10 to the minus 6 reduction when we go from microwaves to optical waves, simply because of the more bandwidth. And uh, uh, in the pulse switches, of course, which as a pulse uncertainty, which then goes with the square root, it's only a factor of 1,000, but a factor of 1,000 is large. And if one does a little bit more analysis, you don't quite get this factor of 1,000, uh, but rather a factor of 100 in that comparison. Uh, but uh, actually, this is not so short as pulse, as we will see later on, you can get uh, a huge reduction by going to uh, optical systems. Okay. So now actually it turns out that as soon as we look at the timing sheet in these optical lasers, usually that was done by using microwave techniques, but actually one shouldn't do that because uh, microwave equipment very fast runs out of measurement capability because of that low timing jitter. so one should use optical methods to measure that jitter. Okay, and we essentially developed various type of what we call balanced optical cross correlators to do precise jitter measurements and uh, just to give you a taste how, how these things work, is is shown here. So we have here a nonlinear optical crystal, uh, which has the properties that if we send two pulses through it, which are orthogonally polarized, then uh, one walks a little bit faster than the other because of biofringence, and it's nonlinear optical material, so it generates a second harmonic. So if we send, send in the red light, we get out a uh, blue light. And uh, when they, and they start to walk through each other, and of course they generate a certain amount of blue light, and we put the dichroic mirror there and couple the blue light out and send the rest uh, back, and they continue to walk through each other. Okay. And uh, we get a little bit more blue light. Or, uh, yeah, and we couple out that here, and we put that onto a differential, uh, we photodetect it and put it in a differential amplifier. And uh, it is clear that we measure as a function of delay between the two pulses an, an S-shaped curve, which essentially generates only some signal when the two pulses overlap, so over a duration of the overlap of the pulses. And if the pulses are a little bit uh, too close together, then they walk already through on the forward path, and you only get signal on one of the detectors and nothing on the other, and you are located here. And if they are far apart, they walk through each other on the backward part. So you get this S-shaped curve. And uh, you get a very sharp slope here on the order of, actually, can be volts per femtoseconds, as you see later on. So that means you can locate, uh, when you can uh, measure with millivolt or microvolt precision, you can easily actually resolve after second deviations of uh, the positions between pulses. Okay. Uh, Yes, these are some uh, technical parameters for what we use here. So you can use uh, 80 picojoule pulses of 200 femtosecond duration are enough to make such measurements. So you don't need very high pulse energy. Uh, and this compares very favorably to microwave techniques where you get only slopes which are on the order of microvolts per femtosecond. So we get here easily 10,000 times more uh, resolution. Uh, and we built now we built now typical fiber lasers and other lasers, as you will see. Uh, this just shows a standard fiber laser, which was developed many years ago by uh, my colleague, Gary Gippen. Uh, how that works is essentially that uh, uh, we have a fiber loop which exploits certain nonlinearities in the fiber uh, to uh, manage to achieve for the pul to achieve pulse shaping, I don't want to go into the details how that works, by the nonlinear fiber optics, and creates an artificial saturable absorber so that high intensities are uh, transmitted through that loop better than lower intensity, and what the laser will then does is spontaneously go from CW operation and produce short pulses because it sees more gain per round trip. So pulse formation is better. And it actually doesn't matter too much. Uh, and these systems, one wouldn't expect that they are very low noise. Actually, that was a dilemma for a long time, I think, in femtosecond lasers, because people didn't think very highly of them. Uh, they were always seen as something which is very fluctuating, uh, which isn't true, as we know today. Uh, but this laser produces something like you know, 150 femtosecond pulses, uh, 200 picojoule pulse energy, and this very high loss. So you wouldn't think that this is a low noise system. 
but when you look at the timing sheet of such, even such a lousy laser can produce, uh, then it's quite astonishing. So how do we measure actually the timing shitter between those two lasers? Uh, we built actually two identical ones because whenever you have a system which has very high precision and you have, don't have measurement equipment, then you build two of them and start comparing them, okay? And that is what we do here. We build two of these lasers and then we put them together in orthogonal polarization, send them through this cross correlator and uh, look at the output signal, okay? And we measure, of course, when the pulses run through each other, this cross correlation trace and we do the feedback loop uh, with a certain bandwidth, the limited bandwidth, uh, to keep them exactly uh, at this position where they are locked. And we do that actually by changing the repetition rate of one of these lasers a little bit by changing the cavity. And uh, uh, yes, and then we can measure essentially out of that loop bandwidth we see at higher frequencies the relative motion between the two laser pulse streams and we can measure the chitter. And if the lasers are very good, then we can lower that bandwidth uh, to keep them in that linear range so that we can get use as a measurement from it. And what is shown here is essentially over frequency, uh, the timing chitter spectral density of the two lasers. And it uh, looks largely like one over F squared. Outside the bandwidth where we lock it, it looks differently in this low frequency. Uh, range, so we look at the blue line here. Yeah? And this one over F square behavior is typically for uh, something which is randomly walking uh, by white and driven by white noise. That is uh, known as like Brownian motion. Uh, so the distance distribution of a Brownian of a particle undergoing Brownian motion, and uh, we can verify from that that really this laser noise is limited due to the spontaneous emission occurring in the amplifier crystal of the laser, it agrees very well uh, with theory up to a couple of details here, uh, which I can uh, discuss in a minute. And it also shows that uh, over high frequencies down to a couple of, uh, yeah, up down to 100 kilohertz, uh, it's actually uh, the, the integrated chitter, which is here, is less than three femtoseconds, actually I just see it's even, uh, the integrated noise here is even less than a femtosecond, up to 100 kilohertz, I think. It should be 10 kilohertz. It's uh, still less than three kilo, than three femtoseconds. And uh, this is a frequency range where we later can lock, anyway, we can suppress all these fluctuations at longer time scale by locking that laser to the microwave oscillator, which is higher stability. Okay. So if we lock such a mode lock laser with a bandwidth of a couple of 10 kilohertz to a microwave oscillator, then we have only, then we have achieved synchronization on the few femtosecond level, okay? And we can use now those pulse stream to distribute them over those fiber links and synchronize all this instrumentation on this one femtosecond pulse stream, uh, one femtosecond time scale, okay? And that is what we did essentially. So let me show a little bit the next step and then I, don't want to go into more detail of this more technical stuff, okay? Uh, but some things are cute. So for example, how do you stabilize uh, the length delay of these fibers to a uh, femtoseconds, which is only one micron. So we have to keep this length one micron stable over three kilometers. So we have, this has to have a stability of 10 to the minus nine at the end of the day, okay? Uh, so we send that pulse stream from a mode lock laser through our fiber link which is made up actually of conventional fiber plus dispersion compensating fiber, but that's also a technical detail. And we have some stretcher in between, which can actually extend the fiber or compress it a little bit. And we take out part of it to use it in an experiment and roughly half of it we send back, okay? And essentially it's the next pulse from the mode lock laser comes and we compare it again in this timing detector, which has very high resolution. And if we chose that's a returning pulse came too late, it will compress the fiber so that the next time it will have the same time, basically, okay? So you can make a feedback loop and keep essentially the propagation time uh, stable, okay? And you can essentially take out all the noise or fluctuations which occur on that fiber link within the travel time, which is even over kilometers, it shows only 10 microseconds, it's 100 kilohertz of bandwidth. And here you see a result, basically, 
Okay, so that shows the operation of such a link, actually in our laboratory, over one week of operation, continuous operation. And you see, in our laboratory, it's not very temperature stabilized, so even this 150 meter long link uh, uh, undergoes temperature variations of the order of a degree, and therefore the fiber expands by uh, 10 picoseconds. And with the feedback loop, which is shown on the left, those uh, uh, expansions are essentially taken out by a factor of 1,000 and compressed to about 10 femtoseconds. Well, RMS, over that week of operation, it's 5 femtosecond root mean square error. And actually, s such links are now deployed at DAISY or FLASH in Hamburg. And uh, in collaboration with uh, two companies, we actually implemented such a system. Five links will be installed at Fermi uh, in Trieste, which I go visit tomorrow. Okay, so now the title was Atta Seconds. So how do we get to other seconds? Okay, we haven't done that yet completely, but uh, there is hope to get there. And uh, that is by using, essentially, engineering that system one step further. And to start is uh, getting a laser, which has now not this uh, one femtosecond high frequency jitter, but starting with something which has maybe, ideally, almost no high frequency jitter. And that is when we go from fiber lasers to, so for example, to solid state lasers. Doesn't have to be but it's at least a, it's a proof of principle that this is possible. There I also actually worked out the other terms which I hide it. It has to do with how much energy we store in the resonator and how much uh, noise we inject into the resonator. And that has to do with the quality factor of the resonator. And if you go from a fiber laser to a solid state laser, then these factors go up dramatically. So a factor of 50 in lower losses, a factor of 50 in more intracavity pulse energy, a factor of 100 by going from 100 femtoseconds to 50 femtoseconds. So we should get another million of improvement or a factor of 1,000 less timing jitter, which brings us from femtoseconds to a few other seconds. And at the moment, this is a complicated laser system. We just want to prove whether that is actually true. Right? We should see that. So uh, since in our laboratory, we anyway built also lots of Thai sapphire lasers. Uh, these are essentially uh, uh, larger, not that cute little lasers like fiber lasers, and, but the material has much larger gain bandwidth, so it allows for generation of much shorter pulses. Uh, and we built this cross-correlate in a little bit more complicated way, but we use again two lasers and locks them together. Uh, and since we have much shorter pulses to start with, we get now slopes which are on the order of one volt per femtosecond. And uh, this is now a very technical plot but essentially what it shows is, again, if we lock two of these lasers together and look at the timing jitter, which is outside the loop, essentially here, 100 kilohertz and beyond, uh, then there is only very little left, only 13 other seconds. And that is due to noise of the pump power fluctuations. One can verify that, okay? The ideal uh, noise floor, which is due to the quantum limits, is actually septa seconds, is less than an other second. So one is spoiled by the other technical uh, uh, problems uh, in the system, and one can work on that. But actually, it's not necessary. So uh, this is the first hint, essentially, that one can build such timing distribution systems probably to the level of, a, of tens of other seconds. Of course, there are many other problems to solve on all the other system components. Okay. Uh, well, you might ask, does that have other implications? It actually has many implications also for other fields. And one is, for example, for analog to digital conversion. If you, uh, you know that today we all like to do everything with the computer, but if you look at an analog signal, which the world is analog, you have to get first that signal into the computer. And how you do that is essentially you sample it discrete in time, and then you also discretize the amplitude. And when you do that business, then you are very sensitive when you look at an analog signal actually when you sample it. Because you see immediately when you sample a sinusoid and you make a little bit of an error, and when you sample it, it's equivalent to, a type, to an amplitude error. So if you want to achieve a certain resolution, you have to have a certain minimum timing shifter in your sampler. And uh, so it's not surprising that if you uh, look at uh, the product of how many bits you can resolve a signal and how high frequency signals you can sample, then there is an intimate relationship which is directly related to jitter. And 10 years ago, this jitter was about one picosecond in the electronic system. 
and today it's about 120 seconds. So it improves about an order of magnitude per decade. That is actually not that fast. That, that is only three bits resolution. Okay. Uh, and so these optical technologies due to these femtosecond lasers, which uh, enable now to build systems which actually have over those frequency ranges which are necessary, uh, sub 100 attosecond uh, level chitter, and due to the fact that maybe a femtosecond laser you can shrink on a chip scale format, whereas microwave sources on that low chitter level are very hard to integrate. Uh, uh, so these optical technologies and these low noise femtosecond lasers allow us to go into that space and just a quick motion. So we actually we had a large program for the last uh, probably six years at MIT together with another branch of MIT, MIT Lincoln Laboratory, to integrate mostly of the optical components in a silicon processing format and bring it on a chip and do some initial tests on it. And we got some resolution. I don't want to go into these details too, too much, but it just shows that uh, this low jitter technologies has an impact on these large facilities, but it also has an impact on other uh, industrial scale equipment. So what that allows to do in the long run is essentially uh, bringing the digital converter technology, which we know today, by three, improve it by three orders of magnitude, bringing these optical technologies together. Okay, so that was just a little bit of an outlier. Uh, so now the next thing is actually uh, the seeding of these X-ray free electron lasers. Ideally, one would like to seed them at the same wavelengths where they later produce the radiation, but for many reasons that's uh, not possible. We don't have yet the coherent radiation source at that X-ray wavelengths, but we have radiation sources in the EUV range, which are uh, pioneered here actually in Politecnico Milano in the ultra-fast optics group. Uh, which are based on high harmonic generation, and then you can use uh, nonlinear processes in these undulators, which I don't want to describe here, to actually br bring that coherence into the X-ray regime. Okay, and uh, that process is called high harmonic generation, and it allows also to directly generate attosecond pulses in the XUV regime. And I just want to say a few comments about that because uh, people here in the audience know that better than I do. Uh, and then I will talk about a laser system which we developed and where uh, Giovanni Zirmi was involved in it, and which might open up to uh, generate uh, laser systems which allow to uh, scale up attosecond uh, pulse sources. So how does this high harmonic generation uh, work? Uh, so we have an atom, uh, and the electrons are held back by a Coulomb potential, and when we apply a very strong laser field, then it can actually happen that we bend down the Coulomb potential and ionize uh, that atom via tunneling ionization, and the electron is accelerated in a half cycle of the laser field and comes back with higher kinetic energy. And if things are favorable with a certain probability, uh, that can recombine and that electron emits an energy equivalent to the kinetic energy and uh, the initial binding energy. That is catched a little bit the trajectory of these electrons here. So we have the electric field as a function of time. And when the field is strong, it starts to ionize uh, with a certain probability the atom and uh, electron wave packet is launched, accelerated, it comes back roughly after three quarters of a cycle or a half cycle. And uh, you have recombination effect events uh, with a certain probability when you uh, come back to the parent atom and that creates an optical pulse, or not an optical pulse, an EUV pulse, which has now uh, this higher energy. That is why it is called very high harmonic generation. And if you have only essentially, if you have pulses, which, which are as short as a single cycle, or not much longer, have a predominant cycle in it, then you can generate a single isolated auto second pulse. And uh, there are specialists here uh, which have developed various techniques how to do that. Uh, my dream was sort of always to generate directly from a laser system a single cycle optical pulse or close to single cycle optical pulse uh, to realize that process and generate an auto second pulse. Uh, of course, the first auto second pulse was really produced in, uh, in uh, Ferenc Krauss's group, and fundamental work has actually been done to enable that. This is the whole fiber compressor invented here in uh, Milano, which allowed directly to generate this high energy. Uh, uh, laser pulses to do this atosecond pulse generation. So what we built over the last 
five years is, so to speak, a laser system which hopefully directly, or it allows actually already directly to synthesize such a short pulse and scale the output pulse energy in its energy without having the limitations of the whole of core fiber compressor. And uh, how that system works is essentially, uh, we start from a laser which generates already uh, a very large bandwidth pulses and also stabilizes carrier envelope phase. So we know exactly the electric field waveform of the pulses emitted. And uh, which we can use actually that broadband spectrum uh, to do what we call different frequency generation to generate also seed radiation at two micron and amplify that in what we call an optical parametric amplifier where also groundbreaking work has been done at Polytechnico Milano here. And we can generate these two micron pulses and control them in carrier and envelope uh, precisely. Actually, with sub-cycle precision about the tens of an optical cycle. And we can also directly amplify our 800 nanometer pulses, uh, which are already two cycles long or three cycles long, uh, which are also carry envelope phase stabilized. And the energy for these pulses comes from a powerful uh, uh, pump laser system, which we have shown here, and I don't want to discuss too much about it, because it's just pumps, these two OPAs. And now we want to generate a pulse, which is uh, shorter than those two pulses. And of course, how we do that is by precisely putting them together in space, again with sub-cycle precision. And uh, therefore, we use again here this balanced optical cross correlator like we used it before in our timing stabilization system and generate a pulse which is much shorter and hopefully has only one significant transient. And by, of course, uh, uh, the idea is you can later uh, extends that to combine more stack spectral components. So you can make essentially a pulse as short as you wish, and you can, scan can also scale the energy uh, as high as you wish and are not limited by the nonlinear processes. Uh, so disadvantage is, of course, complexity. Okay. Uh, and we have implemented that system with the help of Giulio Cerullo. So we have a high energy two micron pulse, a couple of 10 microjoule, and a high energy. 800 nanometer pulse with a couple of uh, microjoule, 10 microjoule, and they are all carrier envelope phase stabilized, and they have good beam qualities. Okay. Uh, and now we have these two pulses, and we put them uh, together in a completely coherent way by implementing a balanced optical uh, cross correlator. So you see again here essentially these two frequency uh, doubling stages. And uh, yeah, I don't want to go too much into the technical details here. But essentially, we produce, again, an S-shaped curve. And uh, if we do a little bit of signal-to-noise analysis, we can easily get that we have a resolution of 30 nanoseconds or something like that. Uh, and if we look at the system, how this cross-correlation looks like, if, uh, if we don't close the feedback loop, since these pulses are shifting around against each other because we have pretty long uh, beam passes in our optical tables by a few femtoseconds. So we definitely would lose the coherent superposition. We also see that most of that noise is very low frequency and can, with a, even with a slow feedback loop, it could be taken out. And then we can superimpose those two pulses with 250 attosecond stability. Okay. So at the end of the day, uh, we generate a pulse which is coherently synthesized out of a component at 800 nanometer and a 200 micron. And we have also essentially verified that it really is a coherent addition uh, by a pulse characterization method which we developed a couple of years ago. Uh, and we think essentially that we have synthesized the waveform. I say we think because uh, there are still a couple of degrees of freedom, the phases between those two pulses, which cannot be measured, uh, but which can be controlled uh, uh, by the pulse shaping methods we have in our system. Uh, so we think we can synthesize a waveform which looks like that, which has only one pronounced maximum to drive, for example, an ionization process and uh, uh, generate a an isolated out second pulse. And, and that was published recently uh, with the two leading authors involving Giovanni Zirmi and also Giulio Cerullo here. And we can do essentially simulations when we shoot such a pulse 
into a helium uh, gas jet. Uh, so that is actually our optimized electric field waveform, uh, which generates the most isolated attosecond pulse. Uh, well, actually, it's not attosecond. You see that the emission here lasts actually over, uh, over several femtoseconds. But still, if we would now put in here a filter, I think actually a, a, a tin filter, would cut off that low frequency region and would just leave over a couple of hundred attosecond long pulse in the uh, XUV region, uh, which is very interesting for doing now a combined IR, because we have still the IR uh, laser, and uh, initiate with this XUV pulse, which is in the soft X-ray range, which is a very element-specific uh, 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 region uh, uh, processes. Okay, so essentially, by generating this very broad pulse, we can generate, hopefully in the future, attosecond pulses directly with this laser system. Uh, and it can be used for synchronized XOV, optical, and IR uh, spectroscopy. So uh, that leads me to conclude with my talk. Uh, so what I try to motivate here is that this new and upcoming instrumentation, X-ray free electron lasers, are essentially super microscopes unraveling the structure and dynamics of atoms, molecules, and condensed matter. And this instrumentation will enable, uh, hopefully, dramatic progress in biology, chemistry, medicine, and the development of pharmaceuticals. And uh, what I really have shown here is that our femtosecond laser technology can produce very low jitter pulse streams, and they can be used to clock six axis XFLs with some 10 femtosecond precision today. And there is a good uh, uh, cause for it that this can be scaled to the other second domain. Okay, and I uh, showed you that we can do coherent high energy pulse synthesis. Uh, actually, what I didn't show you, uh, and which is an interesting scaling, scaling, is actually since we can add now by this coherent uh, addition of laser pulses, with each coherent addition, we add that energy to it. And we add bandwidth to it because uh, uh, each system can essentially handle a different part of the spectrum. Actually, the peak intensity grows with n squared, and that coherent pulse synthesis might be a, a good way to get to high repetition rate, very high intensity lasers, which are interesting for a bunch of other areas like particle acceleration. Uh, so that is something we explore definitely in the future. And also, uh, I haven't showed you, but it can be done uh, to really scale this OPCPA technology in energy and average power uh, by using cryogenically cooled lasers, which we are also pursuing in our laboratory. So that should enable to get to powerful short pulse laser systems to drive this other second science direction and, and other things in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.